You may have heard of holistic medicine and how it treats the whole person. To see the entire Bible as a solid unit is a mostly foreign concept today, but it's the way the Bible was designed. Today on Discover the Truth, we will explore the unique interaction between the Old and New Testaments and how their amazing harmony relates to you, the believer. Stay tuned. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? Welcome to Discover the Truth, a program that returns to the original New Testament teachings of your Savior and His Apostles. If someone asked you to explain the Bible in a nutshell, you would be right if you said that the Old Testament lays down the basics of Bible truth and the New Testament shows how those basics are applied to life, as shown by our Savior Yahshua through His teachings and actions. To put it another way, the New Testament expands on the principles of the Old Testament, guiding us on how to live its precepts. The big mistake in today's approach is to throw out the foundation, meaning the Old Testament, and as a result, leave the New Testament open to a lot of conflicting interpretations, with nothing to link them to. And that is not how the scripture is designed. We read in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Once you understand the simple harmony of the word, so many troubling passages suddenly become clear. The fog lifts, and you see agreement, not conflict, in everything it teaches. The New Testament is like a building and must have a solid footing on which to stand. Our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, adhered to that foundation. He taught the precepts of Scripture each day of His ministry. And here's an important key. The only textbook He taught and quoted from was the Old Testament. There was no New Testament in His day. The Old Testament's 39 books form the basis for his ministry and those of his apostles. The New Testament writers accepted the Old Testament as the framework for their own beliefs. Now the question is, has anything changed? How should a believer today approach the scriptures? Should it be a la carte where you sample a little of this and a little of that, take a little here, take a little there, and ignore the rest? Well, that's how many approach the word. It's easy to make a passage say what you want when you yank it out of its context. Here's an example of what I mean. You may be surprised to learn that the clean food laws given in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 were still in effect in the New Testament, and that means today as well. Yet, many think that in Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10, that what was scripturally unacceptable as food for thousands of years was suddenly fit to eat. This assumption is derived from verse 15. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What Elohim has cleansed, that call not thou common. Most people assume it's talking about food. Knowing that the law was never abolished, according to dozens of scriptures in the New Testament, as well as the plain statement by Yahshua the Messiah in Matthew 5.17, we must take another look at what Peter gained from the vision. Realize that Peter's vision took place many years after the Savior ascended to heaven. He should have known immediately, at the very moment of the resurrection, that the Old Testament's clean food laws were no longer in effect. Yet he confirmed with his own statement that he still obeyed the commands. He said, Not so, Master, for 
I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean, Acts 10, 14. He was still not eating a ham sandwich or slurping down oysters. Why? To understand what the chapter is telling Peter, the rest of Acts chapter 10 must be examined. If you read the rest, you will see that Peter actually gets the point of the vision in verse 28. Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The purpose of the vision was not about cleansing what had always been by law unclean food, but through a powerful illustration, this converted Jew learned a lesson about prejudice. Peter had a problem with accepting outsiders to the faith. He no doubt wrestled with the age-old Semitic notion that Gentiles were unclean. Yahweh knew that this personal issue had to be cleared up before Peter could be sent to the Gentiles to teach the word. Besides the smorgasbord, pick and choose what you like approach to the scriptures, some will add to the word to create a false teaching. An example of this is the common expression, you are saved by faith alone. This is actually a misquotation of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of Elohim. Notice the verse does not say faith alone. The word alone was added to verse 8 during the Reformation 1,500 years after the letter to the Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. It is not found in any Greek manuscript. There is no such thing in the Bible as salvation by grace alone, nor is there any such thing as salvation by faith alone. Where the words faith and alone are found is in James chapter 2 and in verse 17. And there we read, Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Putting the two concepts of faith and works together, the meaning is, for by grace you are saved through faith, which is kept alive and sustained by works. Salvation is based on our faith, but Yahweh's selection of his saints is based on their worthiness, and rewards are established on what we do in this life, not on what we say. Yahshua said in Revelation chapter 2, 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Being faithful until the end by what we do and how we live is what leads to salvation, which incidentally means a position of rulership in Yahshua's kingdom that's going to come to this earth. Okay, so what do the apostles understand about the Old Testament? In Acts chapter 24, verse 14, the apostle Paul said that he believed all things written in the law and prophets. Law and prophets is just another way of referring to the Old Testament. He not only believed its precepts, but he also taught them. Notice what he explained to the young Timothy who was just starting out in the ministry. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is a Messiah, Yahshua, 2 Timothy 3.15. We've got a lot more on this subject. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you are concerned about the coming end times, then you need our free booklet, Is There a Coming Rapture? to give you insightful information on the pre-tribulation rapture belief, understand the history behind it, and the dangerous consequences this belief will have on many believers in the latter days. There is no time to waste. To receive your free booklet, call now. Dial 1-573-896-1000. That number again is 1-573-896-1000. Or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043. Read and request on our website, 
www.yrm.org. If the phone lines are busy, please try again in 10 to 15 minutes. As we read in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul was instructing the young Timothy in his ministry. Now, what scriptures would make Timothy wise unto salvation? Was it the writings of Paul? No. Again, the only scriptures in existence were those of the Old Testament. Was Paul really saying that the Old Testament is still necessary and will guide us to salvation? Well, it certainly sounds that way, doesn't it? To find out for sure, we need to read what comes next in 2 Timothy 3, which is verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture refers to both Old and New Testaments. Both parts of the Bible work in harmony and Paul especially includes the Old Testament, the only Bible in existence at the time, and it instructs in righteousness and in good works. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul said to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The Old Testament taught obedience. Paul clearly said that we must adhere to Old Testament teachings along with the new. So let's review what we've discovered so far. First, we must be careful to test doctrines to be sure they square with the entire Bible. Don't accept any teaching without checking it yourself. That also includes what we say here on Discover the Truth. Get out your Bible, turn to the verse, and read it for yourself. That's not just a good idea. It's what the sincere believer is told to do in John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Search in the Greek means like a hound dog tracks a scent, going wherever it takes him. It does not mean to push in a certain predetermined direction. Just let the scriptures direct you and follow where they lead. As you look up a passage, read the verses around it. Read the entire chapter if necessary to get the proper meaning, as we did with Peter's Acts 10 experience. Second, Passages should never be yanked out of their context and forced into a certain teaching or belief. Find the first time where the teaching was made, most likely it will be in the Old Testament, and trace it down from there. You may find that there was a change in the New Testament, like animal sacrifices, which are not done today because of the Savior's once and for all sacrifice. But that doesn't mean that the concept of sacrifice is abolished. We still have the Savior's sacrifice. And we find that animal sacrifices will be brought back in the millennial kingdom, as we find in the prophecy of Ezekiel 44. Not only was the Old Testament Paul's teaching text, but the same is true for Yahshua the Messiah, who quoted the Old Testament 45 times in the book of Matthew alone. The New Testament directly quotes the Old a total of 263 times. That means that one verse in every 22 New Testament passages is a direct quotation of the Old Testament. If we include references and insinuations to the Old Testament, the figures are far higher. The Old Testament virtually makes up nearly 80% of the Bible, either directly or in shared quotations, references, and allusions in the New Testament. How can we ignore 80% of a book and claim to understand it? It's time to stop looking at the Old Testament as an optional reading and begin to see it as essential 
to the true interpretation and observance of the New Testament. Now, during Paul's ministry, the New Testament was not yet written, let alone codified, which Paul's letters were to be a big part of becoming. The Apostle Paul said that he was educated in the truth by the resurrected Messiah, Yahshua. He wrote, But I certify to you, brethren, that the good news which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. That's Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. Paul's teachings are a continuation of the fundamental truths of the Old Testament, but now under the Melchizedek priesthood, and only a few changes when it comes to animal sacrifices and added doctrines of man. In Romans chapter 3, 1 to 2, Paul asks a rhetorical question. Why pay any attention to the Jew? What does he have to do with us, he asks. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? He then answers his own question. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of Elohim. What are these oracles that were given to them? Let's go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 38, where we read, This is he that was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. What he got from Sinai was the Ten Commandments and the other laws that we find in the first five books of the Old Testament. Oracle is the Greek logion and means the utterances or words of Yahweh. Yahweh spoke the law to Moses, which Moses then transmitted to us. Paul said that these oracles or Yahweh's laws are basic to biblical understanding. He even wrote of those who have lost the importance of the Old Testament and its teachings. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of Elohim, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Peter wrote in, in 1 Peter 4.11 that if you want to be a correct Bible teacher, you must teach the oracles, meaning what Yahweh spoke in the Old Testament at Sinai. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of Elohim, Peter wrote. A lot of Bible understanding today is confused and disjointed, like one of those puzzles where you take the head off one body and put it on another, or those carnival attractions where you put your face in a board, which happens to be a hole for the head of a live size caricature, and you become part of the sketch. Guys look funny wearing a droopy straw hat and holding a pitchfork, and the ladies look hilarious in bloomers. A fact that has been hidden in plain sight for thousands of years is that the Savior of the Bible was a Hebrew, and that means he worshiped in the Israelite tradition. He spent his time on earth teaching his countrymen and women the correct approach to his Father in heaven. Well, we have a little more. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you are concerned about the coming end times, then you need our free booklet, Is There a Coming Rapture? to give you insightful information on the pre-tribulation rapture belief, understand the history behind it, and the dangerous consequences this belief will have on many believers in the latter days. There is no time to waste. To receive your free booklet, call now. Dial 1-573-896-1000. That number again is 1-573-896-1000. Or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043. Read and request on our website, yrm.org. If the phone lines are busy, please try again in 10 to 15 minutes.
In a key statement in the New Testament, Yahshua said he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There is a reason his ministry originated in Israel and not elsewhere, but today's popular worship is basically Grecian. Having moved away from its Old Testament Hebraic roots, in the early centuries of the New Testament. In the book, Backgrounds of Early Christianity, the author makes this revealing statement. The religion of ancient Greece had no creed. There was nothing like a code or system of morality which must be accepted by everyone who worshiped Athena or Zeus. This fact explains what has happened today, perhaps. The rule of behavior in Greek religion was a consensus of the public and not a code of conduct. Much as today's political correctness has become the modern substitute for laws of morality based on scripture, which have been in effect for millennia. To neglect the teachings of Yahweh's standards as found in his laws echoes a paganized, Grecianized approach to worship. Everyone has a say in what is right and wrong. It's like having the answer before you know the question. Paul was not sent to Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus to promote Grecian worship, and neither to have a worship with Grecian elements in it. He was sent there to establish Israelite assemblies of true worship in a pagan environment. We use the term Judeo-Christian as the foundation of the Western culture. Did you ever stop to consider that this common designation reveals a unity between Judaism and Christianity? It says in a thinly veiled way that Christianity is rooted in a Hebraic faith and that's how it has been for 2000 years. A Grecianized context, on the other hand, makes your worship anything you want it to be, and in changes with the times, as a matter of fact. That's the definition of idolatry. Although most of its surviving manuscripts are in Greek, the New Testament is not Grecian, but it's Hebraic. Let's look at the facts. The key personality of the New Testament is a Hebrew savior with a Hebrew name, Yahshua, who quoted liberally and often from the Old Testament Hebrew writings. The New Testament is full of the writings of Hebrew apostles, detailing Hebrew thought, customs, and lifestyles. Its text is filled with Hebrew idioms and expressions, and grammar from Matthew through Revelation. And most important of all, it advances most of the teachings given to Israel in the Old Testament. Think about this. Having Israelite roots explains why churches today still have altars, as did the prophets in ancient Israel, where they sacrificed to Yahweh. It is why there are those called priests today, just as in ancient Israel. Churches continue to take up what is known as offerings, just as Israel did when they came before Almighty Yahweh at the tabernacle and temple. They brought their sacrificial offerings before Yahweh on the Sabbath, on the feast days, and on the new moons. And because it grew out of Judaism, churchianity still acknowledges one day of the week as holy, as Judah and Israel did each seventh day Sabbath. Reflecting its Old Testament ties, the, church, uh, the church's weekly communion service is a takeoff of Israel's Passover with its symbols of body and blood sacrifice. Many churches have sanctuaries or holy places. The tabernacle and Solomon's temple had them first. Others see the church building itself as sanctified. This is a throwback to the Jerusalem temple and the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle of Israel where Yahweh dwelled and where no one could enter but the high priest on the day of atonement. But there's a lot more about today's worship that reflects Israelite roots. The music of the modern song service is directly tethered to the Old Testament practice of singing psalms, which King David set to music, as well as songs Israel sang. Many today have music ministries with music ministers. That's nothing new. The Levitical priests were in charge of the music service as well as everything dealing with worship. Have you wondered where terms like elder, teacher, pastor, and shepherd came from? They trace directly to worship in ancient Israel. You hear the words, amen, hallelujah, praise, and other terminology used in the modern worship service which are borrowed directly from Hebrew worship. In saying hallelujah, you're actually giving worship to the one named Yahweh, saying praise Yah, Hallel, which is Hebrew for praise, and Yah, the first part of Yahweh's name. Hallelujah equals praise Yah. Even the bridal wedding gown with its headdress and veil is yet another indisputable link to biblical worship. 
Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 11 that the female head covering reflects headship, and in the case of the bride, submitting to the authority of the husband. The, New Test or the Old Testament is intertwined and interconnected with modern worship and practice that to think otherwise is to ignore the very structure of the Bible itself. To say worship today has little or nothing to do with the Old Testament is no less ludicrous than saying astronomy can ignore mathematics or a carpenter has no need of construction tools. The Old Testament is the basis on which the new rests. Yahshua himself warned about rejecting the Old Testament in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Moses and the prophets is another way of saying the Old Testament teachings. He commanded that the Old Testament be read, studied, and lived today. Notice what he said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Again, the only word in existence in his day was the Old Testament. Through centuries of preconditioning, today's Bible believer has been led to the very false notion that the Old Testament is mostly useless, its system of worship outdated, its laws unsolicited and unwelcome. The average churchgoer has his understanding spilling over with centuries of calcified traditional notions, is told that the 39 books that come first in the Bible are immaterial, without value today. But if the Old Testament was repeatedly taught and often quoted by the Messiah Yahshua, how can anyone claim it is irrelevant? In Matthew chapter 15, Yahshua said that man's traditions undermine the truth. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15, 7-9. Well, that's all we have today. We invite you to tune in next time as we look again at the scriptures and what they teach in the New Testament in relationship to the Old as we return to the original New Testament teachings of Yahshua and his apostles. We invite you to take advantage of today's free offer by calling 1-573-896-1000 or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. Visit our website at yrm.org. There you can read and request dozens of booklets, watch hundreds of sermons, or tune in live every Sabbath, all at no cost to you. Discover the Truth is funded by our faithful partners and supporters. To donate online, visit donate.yrm.org. Set your DVRs, tell your family and friends, and join us right here next week.